Take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. We're going to begin here. Oftentimes people don't realize how the Christmas story begins here in the book of Genesis. And this, the book of beginnings, not only tells us about the creation of all things, but it also tells us about the promise of the coming Savior, the Messiah, the one who would save his people from their sins. And the story here, it unfolds in Genesis chapter 2 about how God, God created man and placed him in the garden. The Bible says in verse 8, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now he had formed man out of the dust of the ground, according to verse 7, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Each of us here this morning is a living soul, ever living, never dying. We're going to spend eternity somewhere in heaven with God or separated from God in hell. Think of that. Where will you spend eternity when you leave this world? The Bible says that God placed man in this garden... And according to verse 9, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Bible says, notice in verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree, underline that, of every tree, Of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Every tree. Look at all these trees. Every single one of them you can freely eat from. That means you have the choice. Now, God as creator has the right to govern his creation. And love always sets limits for the good of man, as one writer said. God calls us to obey him because we want to, not because we have to. God has not made machines, He's made children. And we, in His image, are made with the ability to choose. We have a free will. God is not forcing Himself upon man, but God is giving him so many blessings. God has given him so much to enjoy, but He set a limit and He wants him to choose to serve God. To obey him. He said, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree, underline that, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Underline that. Look with me here over in chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Now think about it. They had only heard the voice of God up until this time. God's voice spoke in creation and in commanding his children. God created Adam out of the dust of the ground, took a rib from Adam's side and created a woman for him. She would be called Eve, the mother of all living Now think of that. God commanded them. And here in the garden, they were to freely eat of all the fruit of the trees that was provided for them. But yet there was one tree that God said, don't partake of that. Now I'm going to put this option before you because I want you to choose again. And now there's another voice that enters into the garden here, the voice of Satan. The Bible says, And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Now see, look at this, how it unfolds. He immediately puts doubt in the mind of Eve. Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. 
Now, God didn't say they couldn't touch it. She perhaps added to the Word of God. Some have speculated that's how we get in trouble. We doubt God's Word, or maybe we reimagine it as saying something it doesn't. We read into it. But one thing we know is this. The best way to avoid temptation is not to go near it, right? And so it's to stay away from it altogether. But here there was confusion in some measure or another perhaps swirling in her heart and in her mind. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Amazing as you think about this. Maybe you want to underline some phrases here or write some things down beside these verses. He says back in verse number 1, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Isn't that amazing how the devil exaggerates things? I mean, as God said, you can't have any enjoyment from the fruit of the trees in the garden. You can't have any fun. I mean, you can't really enjoy your life at all. Is that what God has bound you by and really restricted you with? The devil, a lot of times, that's the way he works when it comes to temptation in each of our lives, is it not? I mean, you you can't do anything if you're going to serve God. If you're going to do what's right, I mean, you just have such a narrow path to walk. I mean, you're going to be so miserable and so restricted, and you're going to worry yourself to death all the time wondering about the things that you can't do, you shouldn't be doing. Amazing, isn't it? He so exaggerates God's commands. He so underestimates God's love for us and plays it down in our minds. That's the way he is. He's a deceiver. He's the father of lies. And all lies ultimately usher forth from him and his spirit. We think about that. The doubt that he put upon the word of God. The limitation that he would cause her to imagine. Oh my, if you don't grab a hold of this tree right here, this one, if you don't zero in on it, focus in on it exclusively, if you don't begin to even obsess over it, this one tree, can I have just this one, Lord? (laughs) Isn't that amazing? Oh, you, you just see the heart of this. See the thought process of this, the imagination of all this. Oh, as the Lord told you, you can't have any fun. You can't do anything. Everything's wrong. Everything's forbidden. I mean, what about over here? Why can't you do this? And it's like, well, why can't I do that? Isn't that amazing? What about all the things you could be doing? He could say, but he won't say. What about all those other trees? All those other opportunities? All those other options and blessings? Oh, no, he's not going to focus on that. He's going to focus on this one. You can't have any fun. You can't do anything with your life. I'll tell you, if you could just have this one, it'd make your life so much better. Isn't that amazing? Oh, how the devil entices, how he tempts us. Sin is such a big deal. Think about it. It is so expensive It cost Jesus Christ his life. What a payment had to be paid for this great price of sin. Now the devil wants us to think if we sin against God and act outside of the boundaries that he's lovingly set for us for our good, then we're going to take a step up, right? Isn't that what he said? Look at our text here. Verse 5, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I mean, God is holding out on you. God is trying to restrict you. God is really trying to hold you back. And you, you have a choice though. Why won't you better yourself? Why won't you overcome that barrier and rise above it? And be your own woman, Eve, 
Make up your own mind. Live your own life. I mean, who are the people who live for someone else and let someone else tell them what to do and not to do? You be your own boss. You be your own God. You determine what you're going to do. You choose for your life and leave God out of it altogether. You'll be so much better off. We've all heard that (laughs) and all had those thoughts come through our minds, have we not? In some measure or another. But we know instead of taking a step up, she took a giant step down. She could have never imagined the consequence of sin. And all of that, how it would unfold and how there would be broken fellowship with God and how there would be certain things now they would be aware of that in their innocence didn't bother them. They so freely enjoyed their lives and enjoyed their innocence and they enjoyed their fellowship with God. But all that now was gone. Now, something innocent, an animal, had to be slain Blood shed, a covering provided because of the shame they felt and they saw. All of that she could never imagine. But all of that a picture of Christ, the coming Savior, the Messiah, the promised one who would have to come to bleed and die, to offer himself up as a sacrifice for the sin of man. And so you think about this digression. The serpent deceives. He questions God's word and his goodness. He denied God's warning. And then he substituted a lie for God's truth. That's what he did. That's exactly how he worked in Eve's mind. Oh, what a deceiver. And perhaps there's some of us here today questioning the goodness of God, the wisdom of God. If God is so good and so wise and so powerful and so able, why do I suffer like I suffer? Why do I face what I face? Surely the bad and the pain that I'm carrying right now could not be any worse if I stepped aside from serving God with my life. Now you need to be careful when you get to that point. And we all need to be reminded that there are levels of pain that exist that we don't know exist. Eve had no idea the consequence, the pain, the suffering, not only for herself and her family going forward, but for all of mankind as Adam chose to sin with her. And in Adam all men sinned. That sin nature was passed unto us all. Thank God for the second Adam, Christ who was obedient even unto death to bring us back unto God and the fellowship that we lost through the fall of the first Adam. But as we think about this, we think about how people so many times, they, in their humanity, in our limited ability to see the future, we lean to our own understanding, we're swayed. We're thinking, well, doing right is not paying off. Doing right sometimes is... Digging the hole deeper, it seems, making matters worse. And then sometimes you get to the point to where you think to yourself, well, how could something so right feel so wrong? And here I'm called in all of this. Why don't I take this matter into my own hands? Why don't I take my life into my own hands? And why don't I make some choices here? I gave my life to the Lord or I surrendered to Him in this matter, but now it's not improving. And But I think that maybe I could make it better. I could do something that would turn it around in my favor. Be careful when you're there. No wonder the Bible says, lean not unto your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. There's a time when you cast yourself upon the mercy of God and say, Dear God, have mercy on me, Lord. You know my humanity. You know my thought from afar off, and you know that I'm weary in well-doing. Lord, I am wavering at this moment. Lord, have mercy upon me and shore up my faith and help me not to act independently of you. Your revealed will and your word. God has spoken. God had told them clearly, eat of all of these trees. But this one, 
Stay away from it. When you do, you're going to sin. You're going to act independently of me. You're going to break my command. And the consequence will be grave. You shall surely die. Now, they didn't understand the full extent of that, no doubt. Would she physically drop dead? No, that's not what God meant. Because that's not what happened. She didn't die physically right then, though ultimately she did. But she died spiritually. Think about that. The Bible says we're all dead in trespasses and sin. We're all cut off from God. Our spirit is dead toward God. There's no fellowship there. There's no relationship there. We're alienated from God. We need to be brought back to God. We need to be redeemed. Our sin must be paid for. How can we pay for our sin? How can we get back to the God that created us and through a willful choice of sin we were separated from? How can we get back to that God? Boy, we see the sufferings of sin, the sorrows of sin, the consequences of sin are the world over one generation after another. It unfolds before our very eyes and we all bear within our hearts today some measure of sorrow. Because of sin. Ours. The effects of others. But sin passed upon all men. For all men have sinned. We're not only sinners by nature, but we're sinners by choice. We have chosen to sin. We are guilty before God. I'm glad the story doesn't end here, aren't you? (laughs) The Lord said, all right. Get out of here, you're gone. I'm done with you. I'll start over with someone else. Boy, I'm glad the Bible is the story of the unfolding drama of redemption. That's what the Bible is to us. It's God's story about how He's redeeming fallen men, working through the lives of fallen men, drawing fallen men and women and young people back to Himself, working in their lives, helping them to see that there is a God who made all things. There's a Savior who paid the penalty for our sin. We do not have to choose to continue in sin. We can choose to turn to God from our sin and be forgiven, be redeemed Brought back into a right relationship with the God who made us. And then we can choose to glorify Him in this life until He takes us to our heavenly home. Well, I'm thankful that this story continues to unfold, aren't you? And as you read it here, the Bible talks about the effects of the fall in the following verses, especially... In verse 8 of Genesis chapter 3, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. Now, amazing. They could have been freely moving among those trees with themselves and with God. At one time they did, just enjoying all the blessings of God. Now they were afraid. That's the effect of sin. Now they tried to hide themselves. That's the effect of sin. No one can sin and be happy about it long term. You might for the short term, and there is pleasure in sin for a season. But after a while, the guilt of sin catches up to us. The shame of sin catches up to us. And we try to hide it, we try to cover it, and then we're afraid of being found out. And then all of these things make us a contradiction unto ourselves. And wanting what is good and right, but yet choosing repeatedly what is wrong in the eyes of God because we've chosen to make ourselves Lord and Master of our own lives. Choosing again and again to go our way, thinking our way is better than God's way. Surely if you're going to serve God, you're going to have to do nothing but wear, you know, certain attire and, and uh, you know, go certain places and not go certain places and be in church all the time. I mean, come on. How much church does somebody need? Oh, I feel sorry for people who are blinded to the goodness of God. Oh, the true freedom that we have in Christ. All oh, the trees. All the blessings, all the opportunities. But what about that one? What about that one? Oh, that one. 
If you could just get that one, your life would go to another level. You'd be so much better off. Oh, I think about the power of one. The Bible says one sinner destroys much good. Just one sinner can destroy so much good. The Bible says that Jesus spoke these words, one thing is needful to spend time at his feet. Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are past, reaching forth unto those things which are before me. One thing, the power of one, so much can turn on so little it seems. Just one choice, one decision. Oh, the power of one in our lives. There's just one tree. If I can just walk past that tree and not let it have the tug in my heart like it does. Oh, if I could just get beyond it, the curiosity of wonder what that tree tastes like. I wonder what it'd be like to go that way for a time and experience that or experiment with that. Oh, the subtlety, the seduction of sin and how it draws us in. And we think this matter of forbidden fruit, isn't that amazing? See, that's in our nature. Oh, that forbidden fruit, that's what I want. But what about the fruit you can freely enjoy? I don't want that. I've already got that. I want what I don't have. Isn't that amazing? See, that's how we are sometimes and how the adversary Satan plays on that and entices that and feeds that. And fuels that in our heart and in our mind. Oh, you're missing out. you got to have this one thing you don't have. Isn't that amazing how people, they live their lives so blinded to all the good they do have. Because of that one thing they don't have. That one thing. Blind is so much good. I'm thinking of a man by the name of Haman. You remember him? He says there in Esther chapter 5, you know, the king has honored me and I'm exalted and I mean, I am such a blessed man. Had a wife and ten sons. He was a man living a life of access, privilege and honor. And he went home one day so grieved and his wife says, what's wrong with you, honey? And he says, you know, I have all this blessing in my life, all this good. Yet all this availeth me nothing as long as Mordecai the Jew will not show me the proper respect that I deserve. Of all people, he ignores me or treats me with contempt. I can bear it no longer. All of this availeth me nothing. It means nothing to me because I'm obsessing over not what I have, but what I don't have. And until I get that man to bow before me and show me the respect that's due my name, I'll never be happy. You know what? Some of us this morning, that's the only reason we're not happy today. It's not because of what you have. It's because of something you don't have. And rather than being grateful in that regard, you know what? We obsess. We obsess. We can't see the good. All we do is see the bad. All we do is see that what we do, which we don't have. And as a result, we just get so caught up in that. He said, all of this means nothing to me. I'd give all of this up if I could just get that one thing, that one Jew Mordecai to treat me like he should treat me. Oh, wow. Well, we better be careful there because give it all up he did. But did he, get, did he get the honor that he was seeking for Mordecai? If you'll read the story, he actually had to give that honor to Mordecai. Because the king asked him, he said, Haman, uh, what do you think should be done for a man that the king desires to honor? And he said, you know, he ought to be just given the king's robe, and he ought to be put up on a horse, and someone go before him walking in the street. Thus shall it be done unto the man that the king desires to honor. Everybody help me honor this fella. He says, hey, you know what? That's a great idea. I want you to go do that to Mordecai. I'll tell you what. We cannot even imagine the dagger to that man's heart. I wonder sometimes, I just wonder, 
what God is trying to deal with some of us about. And yet we just keep stumbling over it, stepping over it. You know, I would think at some point right there, when the king said that, that would have got my attention. I said, you know what? I'm wrong here. This is not going to end well. I can tell right now. So he went home, told his family, and they said the same thing. They said, oh, my. You're in trouble. You ever heard that? You're in trouble. I'm going to tell. You know? They knew he was in trouble. Trouble's coming. And I'll tell you, before he knew it, the very gallows that he had built to hang Mordecai from, he was hanging from himself. And it didn't stop there. Also, his ten sons hung from that same gallows. And I'm telling you, dear people, there is a God in heaven. Sin is real. Temptation is real. We're all human. We all have temptation in life. We all have choices in life. We all are prone sometimes to zero in and obsess over something we want so desperately that we don't have or God is forbidden at the expense of seeing anew what all we do have. And there's a lot of people who have given up a lot of things for so little that the world had to offer. I heard a man make a statement one time about a man who made a choice in his life. He said, I've never seen a man give up so much for so little. For so little. The devil says, oh no, this is, this is much more than you have. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's an enticer. He's going to build it up. I didn't know this, but someone was telling me recently that uh, those who develop our social media platforms, they tried to study this, and they did, but tried to figure out how could they keep people scrolling. And one place they went to study was Las Vegas. How do they keep people feeding money? One thing they found on the slot machine, it just kept coming, kept scrolling before them, you know. They'd pull it down and, and there it would come, just scrolling before them. And it's like they just couldn't let it go. They couldn't let it go. And they said, you know what? With a strategy, we thought the scrolling would be something that would be so powerfully addicting to people. They just couldn't give it up. What's next? What am I going to miss? Isn't that amazing? There's more strategy behind some of the things that we face in our day-to-day -day lives than we would want to think. But there is a strategy there. How, how can people market certain things? How can they sell certain things? How can they perpetuate certain things that we would say are bondages? And they are. But there are people with strategies on how to perpetuate those in someone's life so that they'll keep coming back. They're a reoccurring customer. And if you're in sales at all, one thing you know that you want is a reoccurring client. <laughs> you know, someone that continually buys from you over and over again as you're trying to get more people, right? And so it's the subtlety of sin as we buy into it and it's reoccurring in our lives. It's something that has a power that sometimes we can't put our finger on. And we know even at a certain point it's not right or it's not best or maybe it's beginning to rob us or limit us in certain ways. And we've got to be brought full circle and say, Dear God, open my eyes. Help me to see this for what it really is. As you study, the Bible says in verse number 10, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? God knows all things, but he wants us to be honest with ourselves and with him. Brought to a place of confession. Whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat. That one tree, you know, I gave you so many others, but did you eat of that one? The man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Adam chose with his eyes wide open to sin. One writer said he chose to forsake the dominion that God had given him over the garden here to stay with his wife because he loved her so. 
Think about it in that regard. Think about it in this other matter. Well, it's the woman. <laughs> well, it's the serpent. Isn't that the way we all are? By nature? Well, I did it, but here's why. It's not altogether my fault. You know, what about what they said or what they did? They made me do it. Expression I used to hear growing up all the time is, the devil made me do it. Let's all blame the devil. It's his fault. It's not mine. Oh, we have certain influences, no doubt. But at the end of the day, when we sin, it's our personal choice and our personal responsibility and accountability to God. The Bible says in verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. For whatever other way that the serpent was able to move freely among creation, God limited and changed that. Perhaps he was upright, some have speculated, perhaps with the legs, able to do certain things, standing erect, but now God took that away. But whatever God did there, God altered that position and that movement. But verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The story continues to unfold, but I stop here this morning. This is what is called the Protevangelium. That's one Greek word put together by two Greek words that simply mean the first gospel. The first good news is the thought. The first gospel. The first mention of the coming Messiah. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. He's speaking here of the coming Messiah. He will ultimately crush your head. He will break your power. It will cost him his life. You will bruise his heel. It will cost him his life. But in giving his life, he will crush your head and break your power and provide a fountain that will flow perpetually. A fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins that continually cleanses us from all sin. Aren't you thankful that we have this Christmas season to celebrate the fulfillment of the promise that God gave all the way back in the garden these years ago. You had a choice. You chose the one over the all others, the so many others. You chose to sin. I told you what would happen. Through sin, you're separated from me. But I won't leave you there. I will come to you. And I'm thankful that Jesus came to us. That's what Christmas is all about. Emmanuel, God with us. God came to move among us at Christmas. The King of Kings was born in a manger. Think of that. The Savior of the world. For He shall save His people from their sins. I'm thankful that I know him today. And I'm thankful that I can really celebrate this season and what it's all about. I hope you know him today. If you don't know him, today would be a great time to get to know him. Because you're going to meet God in eternity one day as your Savior or as your judge. It'd be far better to meet him now in this life as Lord and Savior, to trust him. To turn to Him in your heart from your sin and ask Him to save you and forgive you. That would be the best, would it not? And then to truly celebrate this season and to tell others about Him. During this time of the year, people are more open, more receptive. What a time to tell others about Jesus Christ. 
the Protevangelium, the first gospel given right here in Genesis chapter 3, God says, I'm going to take care of this sin. Thank God he did. And Jesus cried, it is finished on Calvary's hill. Salvation's plan is complete. And you know, the Bible is not only the unfolding story or drama of redemption, but in that story is how God is ever, through the gospel, drawing men and women unto himself. And God is drawing people today. Is God speaking to your heart? You say, well, I already know Christ. Well, he's drawing you closer to him to still believe that his way is the best way and not exchange what you have in Christ for a cheap substitute of what the devil will puff up and convince you for a season is far better and will make your life richer. May God help us. May pull the scales from our eyes and open our eyes. You ever been in a place like that? It's like, what was I thinking? <laughs> Whoa. Somebody shake me out of that. Some of us, that's where we're at today. God just needs to shake us out of that. Wake up. And see what's going on. And see the reality of the choice that's before you. May God, by His Spirit, do just that.